So the next bigger subject of the mainstream Victorian art, especially uh, in the later part of the century, is neoclassicism. And some of you uh, may associate neoclassicism with the Napoleonic period, with the Regency period, with the elevated waistlines and, uh, of course, Napoleon's uh, fascination with all things ancient uh, and, of course, uh, George the Fourth fascination with all things Napoleon, but there was another wave of neoclassicism in the later Victorian period, in the 70s and the 80s, and uh, there is a lot of art from that time that really reflects this interest. This is the art uh, mostly by two uh, two artists, one British, a British aristocrat, in fact, Lord Frederick Layton, and one foreigner, one among many foreign artists who, like James T. Stall, came to, uh, to work in Britain, a Belgian artist, Laurence Almatadema. There are also some British, uh, uh, other British uh, painters, um, you'll see some examples in a little moment. So, um, late Victorian neoclassicism is uh, two things. First of all, it's very antiquarian. Uh, painters would very often travel to Greece and uh, uh, to Italy to look at the ancient ruins, to study, uh, I don't know, the frescoes of Pompeii, to study the um, objects in the museums. They would very often go to the British Museum, like Lawrence Alma Tadema would very often be seen in the British Museum, sketching everything, like details of um, furniture, objects, um, clothes, um, anything that he would later use for the painting. So in the visual sense, they are very often very antiquarian. They are very this detailed depictions of uh, what ancient Greeks and Romans actually wore, what kind of, uh, what kind of um, hairstyles they would uh, have, what kind of uh, objects they had in their homes, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you have a lot of that, but on top of that, you have um, something that's probably best uh, um, uh, embodied by the title of one of the um, yeah. uh, one of the big um, exhibitions of this kind of art uh, in Britain. Namely, they show Victorians in togas. They do not really show real uh, Greeks and Romans. They show Victorians in togas. So they show Victorian morality and Victorian system of belief dressed up in ancient costume. Uh, sometimes it is no costume at all. Sometimes, of course, it is the, the nude because uh, classical art uh, included a lot of nudity and it was not seen as something immoral, but rather as something heroic or something at least uh, embodying the idealized beauty of the human body. So uh, later Victorians loved this kind of art and um, uh, again, there is a very interesting uh, documentary called The Empire of the Nude, if you want to look it up, uh, which shows the uh, late Victorian attitudes towards the nude. And um, to put it in a nutshell, you could show a realistically depicted uh, naked body, especially female naked body, if you gave it a good excuse. And the excuse was usually in the title. So uh, here we have, for example, Frederick Layton, Lord Frederick Layton, so this um, British aristocrat who traveled to the, to the uh, Mediterranean, who would um, paint um, all these, uh, these images, sometimes there using um, the light and the scenery from the, uh, from the Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, one of his works is called Actia, the Nymph of the Shore and it shows a realistically portrayed naked woman 
on the beach with the sea and some uh, dolphins behind her. And if it was just a naked woman, it would be immoral. But this is no naked woman. This is a nymph. This is a creature from ancient mythology. And of course, as a creature from ancient mythology, she has the right to be naked. And this is what happens all the time in Victorian art. You have a nudity with an excuse. So it could be presented to the Victorians, it could be put in the, um, in the uh, houses and shown to the guests. And of course, it would probably titillate many of them. But uh, uh, the excuse would be there that is educational and it shows the uh, sophistication and knowledge of classical art. So you have either um, mythological or mock mythological scenes, or as very often in the case of Lawrence Almata Dema's work, scenes from Roman baths. So we have uh, scenes uh, showing, well, real uh, or kind of um, inspired uh, by uh, real uh, interiors of Roman baths from the, term, uh, from the time of the empire. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, uh, the focus is on, on naked people, naked ladies. Uh, and uh, that's what we have. And uh, especially in the art of Lawrence Almata Demo, we have this kind of equation of the Roman Empire with the British Empire. And this was something that the British loved. They absolutely adored it. They believed themselves to be the inheritors of the greatest empire in the world which they believed the Roman Empire was. So now uh, they were the bringers of civilization, bringers of peace, bringers of culture to the world as in the ancient times they believed that uh, the Romans were. So uh, here we have it. This is, this is the Victorian in Togas, the Roman uh, lifestyle, the Roman celebrations, the, the Roman leisure activities such as the visits to the baths. Uh, but also, of course, they wouldn't be Victorian if they did not exalt family life. So uh, here we have some examples, uh, two baths by Frederick Layton and two by Lawrence Almata Dema. Uh, so let's look at Layton first. When winding the skin, which means um, we have uh, a woman uh, with a, a young girl uh, making a ball of wool for knitting, probably together. Uh, so, um, working together, probably a mother and daughter. And uh, this is a very intimate scene showing the way that. Uh, um, mother teaches her daughter something so like kind of a thread of culture being moved from one generation to another uh, and uh, um, the importance of the woman as uh, the educator and especially the kind of moral educator of uh, of the uh, of the child the other one also by Frederick Layton, is inspired by mythology, the return of Persephone. So uh, the same goddess that uh, uh, Rossetti painted as a captive, um, using one of his favorite models, Jane Morris, here we have a different scene from the same myth. Uh, so Persephone is returned by Hermes, to the arms of her mother, the goddess of vegetation, Demeter. And uh, much has been written about this painting, the way that Persephone is presented, uh, very pale and delicate, like a kind of delicate shoot of a plant in spring coming from, uh, from the earth into, uh, into the sun. And uh, we see uh, the mother, Demeter, welcoming the daughter uh, and the daughter outstretching her arms uh, to meet the mother. Uh, what is Victorian about it, and not really ancient, is that the ancients never, almost never, 
So this particular moment, this particular scene in this myth, this is a popular myth actually um, uh, showing in the symbolic form the, uh, the legend of the seasons of the year. So when Persephone is in the underworld, the matter grieves and there is winter uh, on, on earth. But uh, the Greek images, they show two scenes. They show the abduction of Persephone by Hades. So they have a man grabbing a young woman and putting her on, her cha uh, on his chariot and running away. Or they show uh, Persephone and Hades as king and queen of the underworld. On their thrones, sometimes judging the souls of the dead or something like that. They never really focus on this moment in the myth when uh, the matter uh, demands from uh, the gods the return of her daughter and the daughter is given back for uh, a part of the year to be with her mother. This is very Victorian. This is really, once again, the exaltation of maternity, the exaltation of the, uh, of the uh, woman in the role of the mother and if we look at the two works by Lawrence Alma Tadema um, we have the same the first one a Roman family it shows a family group with a Roman nobleman by the look of his clothes he is a senator and uh, he is with his wife also dressed um, as a Roman aristocratic lady with very elaborate hairstyle and two children. One of the children is playing with a toy uh, at the feet of the parents and another child is a baby being nursed by the mother. Again, this is human nature. Of course, probably there were many Roman aristocrats or even uh, senators who enjoyed family life. But Roman, Roman art never shows this kind of scene. This is Victorian way of looking at the family. This is Victorian way at looking at, matern uh, at maternity. Victorian um, uh, ladies were glorified for being good mothers, for nursing their own children, rather than employing the servants to do that. Uh, Victorian children had big access to commercially made toys, unlike the Roman children. If they had toys at all, they, their toys would be made by the family members. And definitely no Roman senator would be portrayed officially um, enjoying the company of a nursing woman. So um, this is Victorian in toga. And another one by the same artist, uh, Lawrence Almacadema, called An Earthly Paradise. We have a very sweet scene of a young mother caressing a baby. Um, it looks like a contemporary scene, you just need to focus a little to notice that the clothes that the woman is wearing and the furniture and the interiors are ancient. But this is ancient Greece or Rome, uh, but the title, the earthly paradise, refers to Christianity. Why would Romans think of paradise? They didn't have the concept of paradise. They had the, the concept of, um, I don't know, the golden age perhaps, or the Elysian fields, but not paradise. And here we have an ancient woman, very realistically depicted, caressing a baby. So something that, of course, is part of human nature, and I believe that uh, um, this is something as, as old as humanity itself. But the exaltation of this emotional attachment between the mother and the baby, and even so calling it a paradise, is very Victorian. So uh, what we have is, uh, on one hand, this very detailed visual depiction of ancient culture matched with 
Victorian morality and Victorian way of thinking. Later on, towards the end of the century, there are some artists uh, like Albert Moore or perhaps uh, uh, John William Godward that uh, um, play with the uh, neoclassical convention, especially Albert Moore. He doesn't want to depict Victorian morality. He doesn't want to show little scenes that can be deciphered in the way of the narrative painting. Uh, he focuses on the visual, he focuses on the, on the purely aesthetic. So we have the images like Midsummer, for, for example, just showing beautifully dressed women in something that resembles classical uh, robes, just lounging about, doing nothing, uh, resting, looking pretty. And that was the point. But this is really the end of the 19th century and the new style um, of painting, the new form of painting, the art for art's sake starts to be visible. So the visual qualities, the um, aesthetic qualities start to be appreciated in their own right. This is something we will discuss in the following weeks. Uh, and this is perhaps the legacy of the late Victorian neoclassicists, but uh, the majority of this art is as Victorian as they get. So we continue in a moment. And the last aspect of Victorian and especially late Victorian art I would like to touch upon is the so-called golden age of book illustration. Uh, this is something that really is a cultural phenomenon uh, towards the end of the 19th century and at the first years of the 20th century, the so-called Edwardian period, so after Victoria died in 1901, uh, the next monarch to follow was her eldest son. Who took the name of Edward the Seventh? Um, he was quite a party-loving man, and um, uh, and uh, more similar to Victoria's wicked uncles than uh, the great queen herself. But uh, uh, as far as uh, book illustration goes. This was a follow-up to a decade of the great popularity of illustrated press. So even after photography appeared uh, as a technology, it was not yet used to illustrate um, the news or, or the press materials, even the fashion really. Uh, and um, the, uh, the press relied on the, on the illustrators. Uh, so uh, this created a great interest in the reading public in the illustrations uh, so you have illustrated editions of mostly everything nowadays probably uh, the most remembered uh, um, examples are from the children's books and uh, uh, many of the victorian books for children were beautifully illustrated but it's not only uh, a kind of art that was connected with the children. So the first thing is really the press illustration. Uh, there were entire magazines such as Punch magazine that specialized in illustration. Punch in fact was a satirical magazine and uh, uh, it promoted this kind of um, ironic uh, look at Victorian culture. Uh, mostly it was a, a London paper for rich men by rich men so they would make fun of women of servants of fashions of such things and one of the major illustrators of punch magazine was george du Maurier. you can see some of the um, examples of his uh, cartoons for fun uh, he had this very characteristic style that was um, highly valued by the victorians uh, illustrating fashionable people, illustrating the current uh, uh, disputes of the day. So you can see uh, in one of the cartoons in the presentation actually the, uh, the um, division of opinion uh, between the proponents of the 
um, mainstream art or mainstream fashion and the new artistic fashion like those of the pre raphaelites so we have uh, two sets of images showing two women one of them dressed in the artistic fashion and one of them dressed in the classical mainstream fashion and depending who's talking one of them looks elegant and beautiful and natural and the other one looks uh, ridiculous and ugly and um, the, the fashion doesn't really uh, do anything to enhance her natural beauty so of course depending um, whose opinion it is you would have the artistic lady looking beautiful and dignified or the fashionable lady looking beautiful and dignified and the artistic lady looking unhealthy and droopy and uh, and uninteresting uh, George Dumouriez started his career as an illustrator. He also had a, later on a very uh, good career as a novelist uh, and uh, being a famous illustrator, he illustrated his own novel. So here we have a, uh, a plate, uh, an image from Dumouriez's novel Trilby which is a very interesting novel, a gothic novel, about the artist's model. So it's set in the artistic circles uh, in Paris uh, with a group of English art students uh, meeting a young uh, woman uh, who's also British, who becomes uh, their model, who becomes the fiancé of one of the uh, one of the uh, painters, uh, but she gets under the spell of the evil uh, Jewish or Polish Jewish even uh, music teacher called Svengali. So um, this is well. If you're interested in gothic novel, absolutely go uh, and uh, read Trilby. Uh, here you have one of the original illustrations of Dumouriez, and there are. I think more than a hundred in the original edition of the novel. Uh, other important illustrators, uh, of course, we have uh, um, we have people like Patrick Potter, uh, the um, writer and illustrator of many popular books for children, uh, especially books about little animals like Peter Rabbit here. So she uh, would also do a text and illustrator, a little bit like the Pura Fairlights. Remember that Rossetti would write uh, poetry and then illustrate it. Uh, probably the greatest illustrator, the English illustrator, because this was an international uh, phenomenon and there are lots of um, continental illustrators uh, from this period who are, who are absolutely brilliant. Um, but the English master of uh, book illustration of this period is called Arthur Rackham. Uh, he was the, the man who illustrated some books for children uh, like Alice in Wonderland, but also, well, Peter Pan, the original Peter Pan, before, the, before Walt Disney got him in his hand, uh, which is a dark spooky story and if you look at the original illustration one of their original illustrations showing Peter Pan this is absolutely spooky uh, but he would also illustrate um, works of Shakespeare and uh, all kinds of books about uh, Norse mythology and uh, such uh, such things so uh, very often these illustrations uh, even those that are nominally for children, they touch upon this kind of gothic mode and darkness and uh, the secret places in human soul that are not uh, um, light and pleasant. Uh, so um, uh, another, uh, another illustrator from this period is uh, Walter Crane. You have the image, one of the images he made for uh, Beauty and the Beast. This is uh, the late 19th century. This is the period when some of the traditional fairy tales, the original folk tales, are edited uh, for, uh, for publication, very often beautifully, um, beautifully illustrated. Uh, and uh, very often, if you look at um, the, uh, the tales such as um, the tales of um, Gathered by Brothers Grimm uh, or um, Beauty and the Beast or, or the many uh, fairy tales uh, by uh, Hans Christian Andersen. 
uh, they are dark and they are spooky and they are uh, really something that perhaps modern parents would hesitate to show their children in the undiluted form uh, but for the turn of the century artists they were a treasure trove and you have beautiful editions beautiful illustrations actually i was lucky uh, in my childhood to have uh, maybe lucky well they were spooky and scary and they perhaps scarred me for life uh, i had a beautiful uh, edition of the fairy tales by hans christian anderson from uh, the first years of the 20th century illustrated by uh, a french illustrator Ed edmund dulac so if you are if you're interested google his name and wow they are just beautiful but the last illustrator i would like to draw your attention to is again an englishman audrey birdsley probably uh, the best definitely one of the very very few exponents in the british art of the art nouveau uh, you may recall the art nouveau um, architect and designer when we talked about scottish art um, Charles Rennie uh, Mackintosh. Uh, Audrey Bersley was a, um, a graphic artist and his art is definitely dark and even sometimes perverse. He would illustrate uh, classical stories, he would illustrate the works, for example, of um, Oscar Wilde. The, uh, the, um, stories and uh, theatre plays by Oscar Wilde and uh, if you know anything about Oscar Wilde he was not sweetness and light and he was uh, uh, rather uh, known for his biting wit and his uh, rather perverse imagery sometimes. So we have uh, uh, here one of the illustrations showing kind of stylized uh, images of human forms especially the kind of femme fatale characters uh, morphing into natural forms uh, reminiscent of plants or birds or something uh, if you google the name of Aubrey Bertley uh, you can find uh, much darker illustrations with a lot of eroticism in them for example so uh, this is really the end of the Victorian way of thinking and uh, this is the beginning of the new age and uh, in the next week we will be moving towards the 20th century and uh, seeing the impact of the dramatic events of the 20th century on British art. Thank you.